Namaste and good morning, everyone. Let's start our Thursday class where we are studying the Shvetashtva Upanishad these days with some prayers. Om Guru Brahma, Guru Vishnu, Guru Devo, Maheshwara, Guru Sakshat, Par Brahma, Tasmai Shri Kurve Namaha, Om Bhudhavaswaha, Tatsavitra Vare Neyam, Bargo Devasya Dhimahe, Diyo Yonaha Prachodaya, Asto Ma Sadgamya, Tamso Ma Jyotirgamya, Mrityor Ma Amritam Gamya, Om Sahnavavatu Sahnabhunaktu Sahviryam Karvavai, Tejasvi Navadhi Tamastu Ma Vidvishavai, Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. So chapter 6, Verse number two we are going to do today. We've been paying attention to all these verses uh, where these rishis, uh, and now the students who were listening to the discourses of the rishi, who has concluded that God is the cause of the world. So now they are contemplating uh, on the words which were recited by their guru. So now they are discussing among themselves how God created this creation, this world. So let's look at verse number two. Sorry about this little noise. It will be gone pretty soon. So, but I'm going to recite this mantra. Yen avritam nityam idam hi sarvam gya kal karaha guni sarv vidya. Ten ishitam karam vi vartate, ha prithvi apahateja anil kani chintatam. Yen means by whom? Avritam pervaded. See, like a covered. Nityam ever. Idam this, he means indeed. Sarvam all. Gya knower. Kal Karaha, the creator of time. Kal means time. Same ko banane wala. Kal Karaha. Guni, possessed of qualities. Guns, Sattva Rajas Tamas. Sarva Vidyaha, he who is omniscient. Sab kuch jaanne wala, Sarva Vidya. Ten means by him, Ishitam, willed, Karam creation or the entire activity of creation. We vartate appears. Ha means well known. Prithvi, earth. Apaha, water. Tejaha, fire. Anil, air. Khani, space. Chintiyam, has to complete it upon. Chintanya, chintiyam. He, so this he means God. He, by whom indeed all this is ever pervaded. Who is the knower, the creator of time, who possesses qualities and is omniscient, willed by him, the entire well-known activity of creation, that is earth, water, fire, air and space, appears. This has to be contemplated upon. So God, the existence, consciousness behind creation, that's what they are telling us. See, the material cause always pervades the thing created. Just like if something is made out of mud, Mud pervades that part which is made out of mud. Or if something is made out of gold, that piece of jewelry, gold is pervaded the entire jewelry. So the material cause always pervades the things created. So prakriti is the material cause of this world. However, existence exists before Prakriti. 
So existence always pervades all that can be indicated at, as this. This means whatever has been created. And exist, existence is uh, full of energy. That is the energy. And prakriti is uh, inert. This also includes not only the pot and the gold or the trees or us, it also countless cosmos, the body, senses, vital air, mind, the elements, the unmanifested property, all of it, anything which has been created. God is the sentient cause of the creation. And consciousness alone illumines all in general. He is the omniscient Lord, Sarvagya, who knows everything. In fact, every individual thought he knows, Sarvavit. See, just like the light of the sun illumines everything in general, but it will reflect, especially on all reflecting surfaces, like water or mirror. But sunlight is everywhere. The same thing, the God is everywhere. But in certain places, we see the reflection of that consciousness. That God, the changeless creator of time and qualities, he says. Time. Time is an imperceptible factor. We know the time only through the change in the objects. We realize how much time has passed when we observe the wrinkles on our face or the grayness in our hair. Then we know time has passed. In fact, only when our thought changes or the object of our thought changes, we perceive time. The Yoga Shastra explains that in the deep sleep state, the same thought of the absence of objects alone exists. So we are unable to perceive the passage of time. So that means in the deep sleep, we don't even know how much time has passed. God is the changeless substratum of all changes, which we call time. This is what he's trying to tell us. And he is the treasure house of all attributes and virtues. Sarav Kalyan Gun Nidhan. He is omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, presiding over all our actions. He is the giver of all results, compassionate. Gracious, forgiving. He is the abode of all love and joy which sustains this creation. We worth. That means creation as an appearance. Whenever the material and the sentient cause is the same, the thing created is an illusion. For example, the waking mind alone provides both the material and the knowledge for the dream world, which is only an appearance. That's why we say it's a dream. There's no reality to it. Similarly, God is both the material and the sentient cause of creation. Creation is only an appearance. Vivart, vivart means to appear different. So the existence, consciousness, God appears as this changing world of names and forms and qualities without undergoing any change. There's never a change in God. There's never a change in the Atma. It's almost like that example we often use a rope seeming as a snake. Okay, so there's no change in the rope. Rope was a rope. It just seemed as a snake. 
when the light was thrown on it, we knew that it was just a rope. So rope didn't have to change. The same way, ignorance, through ignorance, when we recognize ourselves, we think we are the body or we are the mind or we are the titles given to us. But when the gyan, the light of the gyan is shown, then we know who we are. This atma, which is none other than Paramatma. So he says, contemplate on it, because that is the means. So these seekers, the young students, they understood the nature of God and creation as his glory through discussion. Through the sermons or the lectures or the words of the Guru. So now they are supposed to contemplate and experience it themselves also. So meditation is the means to know the truth as one's own self. Over here, this contemplation, deep contemplation is meditation. So truth has to be contemplated upon to be realized. So it's not just only the Guru realized it and that's enough for us. No, we have to realize it ourselves also. So now these young seekers, they contemplate further how God created this world in the next verse. Tat karam kritvaha vini vartehe bhu yaha tatvasya tatvena se mate yogam ekena dvabhyam tribhi ashtbhi this is verse number three. Tatkaram, that work. Kritvaha, having done. We nivartya, having examined. Bhuyaha, again. Tatvasya, of principle. Tatvain, with principle. Semate, having brought about yogam association. Ekain with one, dvabhyam with two, three bhi with three, ashtabhi with eight. Va means or, kalin with time, cha ev as well, sukshamai with subtle qualities of the internal organs, sukshmai, atam gunaicha, okay, atam gunaicha, that is the atma, cha means end. Having finished that work, he examines it and brings together one principle with another. One, two, three, or eight in association with the time and the subtle qualities. So he, he is like a grand mixer. The previous month explained that God creates the five great elements. Earth, water, fire, air and space. Five great elements. Then he examines his creation, finds it lacking in spirit. Without the spirit, the matter cannot be enlivened. It's inert. Creation is lifeless and uninteresting. Without that spark of light in there. So he combines Yogam, he combines the matter and the spirit, the inert and the sentient, and this interesting, mind-blowing creation comes about. So inert with the sentient, matter with the energy. There's a union of these two. It's almost a wedding between these two. So the spirit or the sentient principle is one alone. So when he says ekain, that means that light 
that tatra is only one. So the spirit is one alone. It's homogenous. We think that my atma and your atma, or atma in the dog or in a plant is different than our atma, no. It's one alone. However, prakriti cannot be seen as one, two, three, or eight. Seen as one, God creates with the combination of the sentient principle and the primordial matter of Vidya. Then we see two. Prakriti and Purusha, we see two. Then he combines the spirit with the merits and the demerits, dharam and adharam, of previous creations, giving rise to the present variety in creation. So God combines the spirit with the three inherent qualities of Prakriti. So that's what three is. Satav, Rajas and Tamas. To create this world. So first, Brahma and the Prakriti. Then these three guns of the Prakriti, that is three. So then, what is eight? See, Ashtabhi. Eight fold. That is a space, air, fire, water, earth elements, mind, intellect, and the ego. Ashtadha Prakriti. That's what Lord Krishna also said in Bhagavad Gita. My Ashtadha Prakriti. That's how this world is created. Tat karam kritva vi nivrathe bhuyaha. This is a phrase, the first part of this verse. There's a, another beautiful understanding of God's nature, having created the world, having allotted all the duties and positions, created all the laws, rules of beings, instruments, or even the materials necessary to run the world. He withdraws and silently watches. The world then functions automatically in his mere existence. He does not intervene. He only watches. That is what we nivritya means. Because sometimes we wonder why God doesn't interfere. This is what he decided. He created, then he watches. This is indeed a sign of efficient management. He doesn't have to micromanage it. He just watches. After creating this beautiful creation. After having created this great grand creation, what does he do then? Next mantra explains that. Arambhye karmani gunan vitani bhavancha sarvan vini yojetya te sham abhave krit karam nashaha karamakshe yati satatvata anya. Arambhye, having begun, karmani, actions, the works. Gunan vitani, associated with the qualities of prakriti. Bhavan, effects. Cha means and sarvan all, vi ni yojiet, employees. Ya means who. Second line, te sham der abhave, absence. So that means when they wear out. Krit karam nashaha, that which was created vanishes. Krit karam nasha. Karam kshay, when the creation is dissolved. Yati means reaches, sa means he, tatvata from prakriti, anyaha, distinct. <clears throat> Having begun the work of creation, associated with the qualities of prakriti, he employs all the effects of prakriti 
and when they disappear, we are out here. That which was created vanishes. When the creation is dissolved, he abides in his own self, which is distinct from the prakriti. So that means a dissolution follows creation. So it's a cycle. Something is created, then it's sustained, then it's dissolved. And the cycle continues. We all know what begins must end. And taking recourse to the power of Maya, which has the qualities of the Sattva, Rajas and Tamas, the Lord creates this wonderful creation, which manifests the various effects of Maya. When the total inherent tendencies which triggered this creation, which really set all this into motion, get exhausted, creation comes to an end. The karmas of all beings, which are to be manifested in the cycle of creation, are the momentum. That momentum is the one which keeps this creation going, our own karmas. Once they are over, that particular creation is wound up. And that is called dissolution. God in his absolute nature, which is nameless and formless, existed before the creation. He appears as the world and when the appearance also disappears, he remains as always in his absolute pure nature, which is called Sat Chet Anand. Existence, consciousness, and bliss. He was like that, and he remains like that. No change. And this verse can also be seen from the standpoint of our own individual journey. See, whether we look at it in the aggregate, macrocosmically, that God creates, sustains, and dissolves. But no change in God. The same way as an individual, the soul, the Atma. No change in the Atma. With the power of the Atma, this inert, matter becomes enlivened, goes through all these changes. Birth, growth, decay, death, all this happens according to our own karmas. Then ultimately, the soul is in its pure form the way it was, no change in the Atma. So whether you look at it macrocosmically or microcosmically, it's the same, same story. Return journey is there. The vasanas that we are born with creates desires and prompt actions. That is what gives momentum to all we do. Actions done with ego and egocentric desires for selfish gains and for our own pleasures, they keep us in the bondage by multiplying our desires, creating more vasanas. However, actions which are done as a worship of God, without likes and dislikes, selflessly with love and dedication, they purify our mind. They help us exhaust our vasanas. And do not, we do not create new vasanas with that kind of a living. And that's what Lord Krishna called it a karam yoga in Bhagavad Gita. He said, whatever action you do, mundane, religious or social, offer them to me. When we just learn to offer all our actions, the fruits of the actions, all those results will free you from the bondage of action. He promised that. You can open later on, open your Bhagavad Gita books, chapter 9, 
verses 27 and 28. See, that's why Bhagavad Gita is called a Shastra. Shastra. Shastra is the one which is not only giving you what to do, but how to do and what the effect of that will be too. Last night, some young girl was asking me that which scripture I should study. I said, Bhagavad Gita. Study and re-study and re-study and re-study. Until the essence of the Bhagavad Gita is seen in your own life. This is not something we recite. This is not something we just only remember. We got to live Gita with our actions. And that's what Lord Krishna promises. Our vasanas, we are here to extinguish our vasanas. Not keep on increasing our vasanas. When the mind is purified, with that kind of a living, the vasanas are exhausted completely. And what happens? We cut the knots of our heart. And what are the knot of our heart? It starts with the ignorance. Ignorance is the very first knot of the heart which binds us. Then comes our desires, then comes the karma. So with the living like that, we cut the knot of the heart, dispel all the doubts, exhaust all the vasanas, and finally we abide in the self within. Munda Kupanishad says that. The individual's heart is filled with many vasanas. Many vasanas. That's why we are here. How can we exhaust all of them? If you want to do one by one, we can never exhaust them. Because we'll never know which particular vasana is exhausted. Because the minute we want to know which vasana is exhausted, a new vasana has erupted. When our dependence on the objects vanishes, and everything is an object. We are not talking about the physical objects. We are talking about the ideas also. Anything other than the Atma and Paramatma is object. Whenever dependence on the objects vanishes, when there is no craving to gain it, no excitement and thrill on gaining the worldly things, or no desire to repeat the pleasure which we had, we can safely say that the vasanas are exhausting. Only we know that. For example, the toys which a child plays, as the child grows up, those toys know more excites him or her. Whether they are the cars or the dolls or anything else. Some vasanas get exhausted with age, definitely. We are not doing what we did when we were younger. Some by right thinking and many through dedicated actions. But all the vasanas can definitely be exhausted through knowledge of the truth. The power of that light, of that ultimate truth is you could be very young or you could be very old. You could be a male or a female, can be a householder, or a renunciate. If that fire of the knowledge of the truth has been ignited, all the vasanas will burn in it. So sure, until then, do the selfless service. 
Make sure your thinking is right. Contemplate upon it. Meditate, serve. But once this light has been ignited, you will see that the vasanas will end. So in the previous uh, mantras, uh, means are recommended to lighten the load of vasanas. Now in the next mantra, subtler means of the upasanas are also given. Upasana, worship and meditation. Verse number five. Adi sasayog nimithetu trikalat paraha aklaha apidrishtaha tam vishwar upam bhavabhutam idiyam devam swachitastam upasya purvam. This is verse number five. Adi, that is the primordial being. So means he, Sanyog Namit Hetu, the cause for the union. Trikalat Paraha, beyond the three periods of time. Para, you are all familiar with Para and Aparaha. Para is beyond, Apara is lower. So beyond the three periods of time, Trikalat. Akala, devoid of parts. Appi also drishta recognized. Tamahim Vishwarupam with the universal form. Bhavabhutam who has become the whole world. Idiom adorable. Devam effulgent. Swachitustham present in one's own heart. Upasya having worshipped and meditates. Purvam earlier. He is a primordial being. Adi. The cause for the union. This union means of the matter and the spirit, etc. Okay. Beyond the three periods of time. Three periods of time. Yesterday, today and tomorrow. Bhut, Bhavishya, Vartaman. And also devoid of parts. So that means you really cannot divide God. As I was telling you earlier, it's homogenous everywhere. There are no parts of it. This effulgent and adorable Lord with a universal form who has become the whole world can be recognized as he is present in our own heart as worshipped and meditated upon earlier. So God unites. Sayog Nimit Hetu. This is the very first thing this mantra says. So the primordial being, the cause of all which we call God, is the great uniting factor in the world. He unites matter with spirit. the various causes with each other and with their effects, the actions with the result, the doer action with the enjoyer of the result. One thought with another thought. How does it get united? And then he says, God is love. And love is the greatest uniting factor, we know that, between any two objects or beings, love. That's why it's called adorable idiom. It is he alone he, who brings together the discipline and the guru connects the seeker with the spiritual practices needed to progress. or the noble actions we want to do. To unite our noble actions with the noble thoughts and the virtues also. Ultimately, it is he alone who connects us with him 
through self-knowledge and self-realization. God is adorable. Idea. Even though he is timeless, trikalat para, and his partless akala, he alone has become the world. And all its names, forms, and qualities to bless us. No matter which form of God we look at, it's blessing us. He's seated in our own heart as our own self. He is naturally the most loved and adored. Upase, worship and meditation. The means to realize this adorable God is to always remember him. And be aware of his presence while doing all the activities. Yesterday I got a call, a few days ago I got a call from Australia. The young girl, she was confused a little. Certain days, can I remember God? I said, sure. Not just certain days. Every day, every hour, every minute, every second. How about in the bedroom? Why not in the bedroom? What surety do we have that we will die in our temple room? Make a habit of remembering God in every room. I recall that my own mother, she used to go into Samadhi in the bathroom. We used to live in Shimla and she would go wash the clothes on that natural spring and she will be in Samadhi. God is everywhere. Remember that. No place where he cannot be. So means to realize this God, adorable God, is to always remember him and be aware of his presence through all our activities. And a chit word means this faculty of remembering over here. Because all our memories are stored in our chit. Not just on the outer mind, but in deeper layers of the mind. Saravachita's thumb is to keep him always in our memory, being near God. That is upasana. It's not only physical sitting in front of God or God's statue, but keep your mind, the inner layers of your mind connected with God. Just sitting over there at the feet of God. Connected to him through your thoughts, through your words, through your deeds. That's how we make ourselves pure. We become virtuous. Just like him. He's all pure. All love. All bliss. So when we become one with him, but in order to become one, we have to purify ourselves though. And this is the purification technique these great rishis are giving us. Because with such a mind, meditation on his true nature is definitely easier than it strengthens our connection. No fear of God. Nowhere it's mentioned that we should be afraid of God. God is all loving, all beautiful, all blissful, all joy. Through realization, we become one with him, one with him. In the next verse, we'll see next week how the glory of the God is extolled. But we'll end our today's class here with verse number five. Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachate Purnasya Purnamadae Purnameva Visheshyate 
ओम शांति 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 ओ थैंक यू वेरी मच